Wow, thank you for that. <laughs> so from the south side of Chicago to Milton Academy, to Harvard, to Harvard Law School, to the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, to head of the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, to the top levels of corporate law, to the governorship of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. What a long, strange, and consequential trip it's been. Here to reflect on it is this year's baccalaureate speaker, Deval Patrick. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Falk, to you and members of the Board of Trustees, to Dean Bolton and members of the faculty and staff, to Reverend Spaulding and all of the Reverend clergy, to the proud parents and families who were here, and most especially to the worthy graduates of the class of 2015. I can't believe I have to follow Marguerite. <laughs> you tore it up, girl. <laughs> Fantastic. I am, uh, I'm glad to be with you this evening, honored and humbled, in fact, but to be truthful, it's also a little weird. Governors don't normally do baccalaureates. I checked. <laughs> we might do the odd commencement address here and there, but not baccalaureates, because baccalaureates, I am told, are supposed to be the moral charge. <laughs> a sermon, in fact. And governors, whether sitting or form formal, uh, formally ones, don't normally do sermons. Then again, students, especially ones about to embark on their adult lives, don't normally listen to them. <laughs> and since it's mainly you and me here this evening, uh, let's just acknowledge these truths up front. Somebody advised me that I could say anything I wanted so long as it is brief. I've decided to take the advice on brevity. I once knew this campus well. 45 years ago, at the age of 13, I came to Williams College for a couple of weeks as part of the orientation for a program called A Better Chance. Until then, as the President said, I had grown up on the south side of Chicago. Milton Academy, thanks to the ABC program, was my introduction to the larger world. And the orientation at Williams College in the summer of 1970 was my gateway to Milton. So it's always nice to be back. Sermons are not unfamiliar to me. Where and when I grew up, church was a big part of my life. My grandmother was the featured soprano in her Baptist church until she had some sort of falling out with the preacher. <laughs> After that, my sister and I were sent to the Cosmopolitan Community Church at the end of the block, a quiet sanctuary as black churches go. We had a woman pastor, an uncommon thing in those days. Cosmopolitan had in common with all black churches the transformative power of music and the watchful presence of old ladies in hats who took their worship seriously. One of the many lessons I learned in that community of friends and family was about the importance of having a moral foundation. It wasn't about sanctimony or any sort of moral superiority just a set of ethical expectations the community had of us, and most importantly, that we were expected to have of ourselves. Those old church lady ladies brought an unfailing sense of moral duty to everyday life, an old-fashioned notion that on the way to work on Monday, you don't leave your conscience at the church door, that faith is not just what you say you believe, but how you live, and how the best of them lived offered moral leadership to the rest of us. It sounds a little too grand to say that in my time as governor, I tried to serve with my faith as a moral rudder. I am no evangelist. I have not followed the example of one of my fellow governors who in the midst of a summer drought convened a press conference to pray for rain. <laughs> Even by my somewhat relaxed Presbyterian standards, I am an unfinished Christian. Where I grew up, faith was not a matter of showy piety, but rather of quiet acts of kindness and compassion. 
I tried to do my job, indeed to live my life as Micah teaches, by doing justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly. Maybe it's simpler to say that I've tried to behave not so much as if God were watching, but, if the, but as if those old ladies in hats were watching. <laughs> in my work as governor, that meant I tried to remember that there are human beings behind policy choices, strivers and strugglers with aspirations and frustrations and anxieties. I tried to make policy matter where it touches people. Most of the people I met and served didn't want or expect government to solve every problem in their lives. They just wanted government to do its part to help them help themselves. A good school, a safe neighborhood, an expanding economy and the tools to ready themselves for it. A decent road, safe bridges, convenient trains. When I hear the conventional policy debates about charter schools and teachers unions, taxes and spending, regulation and free markets, it strikes me that both liberals and conservatives have mastered their respective sound bites, but lost sight of or interest in the people at the end of these choices. It's easier than it ought to be to do so. Jobs like governor are a blend of substance and performance art. And more and more of what counts, or at least what gets noticed, is the performance and less the substance. When I left office in January, Massachusetts was first in the nation in economic competitiveness, student achievement, health care coverage, energy efficiency, entrepreneurial activity, veteran services, and so much more. We had reformed more of state government than any administration in decades. Our budgets were sound and our bond rating was the highest in the Commonwealth's history. Still, I wonder, as anyone would, I think, in these days, where image counts for so much, whether any of that substance ultimately matters or lasts. A Baptist bishop told me recently that it's important to listen for God. He said that God answers questions like mine, but if you're not listening, you'll miss the answer. So I've been listening. In 2010, with the help of our legislature and many grassroots advocates, we passed a significant reform to our Cory system. This is the system that tracks every offender's criminal rec record, and it had become a practical barrier for many people with minor offenses who were trying to get back into productive life. So we took on the task of fixing it. When the bill was complete, we hosted a signing ceremony in a packed, unair-conditioned building in Roxbury, a tough neighborhood in Boston, on what, what felt like the hottest day in the history of time. <laughs> Hundreds of people came. And despite the heat and crowd, excitement was high. In the midst of the joyous pandemonium after I signed the bill, a man handed me his cell phone and asked me to speak with his friend on the other end. The voice at the other end of the line thanked me for signing this bill and said he, would, he knew it would make a difference in his life. I smiled, said I hope so, handed the phone back and thought nothing more of it until last spring. I arrived in, spring, in Springfield early for an event. We decided to grab lunch at a restaurant down the block from the Basketball Hall of Fame. The troopers I was with and I were waiting for our takeout near the front of the restaurant when a man in chef's togs walked past. He stopped and he did a double take, which by the way, I have come to attribute to the fact that I'm taller on TV. <laughs> the man said, are you Governor Patrick? I said, yes. Then he asked, do you remember signing Cory reform? I said, of course I do. He said, do you remember speaking to a guy on a cell phone right after you signed the bill that day? I said, as a matter of fact, I do. He said, I am that guy. He said, I was sitting in prison when you took that call. When I got out, I got this job on account of Cory reform. Today, that man is the executive chef at that restaurant. That policy. That policy touched a person, and that is what I think matters, and I believe that will last. There are statistics to show the aggregate results and awards to recognize the body of work that my team contributed, but that day reminded me, as I have been reminded countless times before, that what matters more is beyond the statistics and surveys. It's the human souls behind the policy choices we make. 
There are families behind the affordable housing program, travelers behind the bridge or road project, children who will be children only once behind the line item for schools. Sure, we have to balance budgets, and we did that. But if we don't see the people behind the budget, the meek as well as the mighty, what's the point? Indeed, without that, where is the moral leadership? I mentioned earlier that I grew up on the south side of Chicago. I lived there in a two-bedroom tenement with my grandparents, my mother and sister, and various other relatives who came and went. My mother, my sister, and I shared one of those bedrooms and a set of bunk beds, so you'd rotate from the top bunk to the bottom bunk to the floor every third night on the floor. In the 50s and the 60s, in that neighborhood, everything was broken. Broken playgrounds, broken sidewalks, broken families. There was a lot we didn't have. But one thing we did have was a community, the kind where every child was under the jurisdiction of every single adult on the block. If you messed up in front of Ms. Jones's, she'd go upside your head as if you were hers and then call home so you get it two times. <laughs> what those adults were trying to teach us was that membership in a community means having a stake in your neighbor's dreams and struggles, as well as your own. That we have a moral responsibility to turn to each other rather than on each other. What does that mean for a governor? Well, to me, it meant that we should govern actively so as to help people help themselves. Because scripture teaches that faith demands action. Micah doesn't say to reflect on the abstract meaning of justice, mercy, and humility, but rather to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. Action, not just consciousness, was central to the expectations of the old ladies in hats back on the south side of Chicago. Reach out to people in their darkest hour. Help the poor struggling to keep their heads above water. Encourage those who have lost not just their way, but hope itself. Sure, we should debate what part government should play in meeting such moral obligations. But let's not forget in the heat of that debate that government is just the name we give to the things we choose to do together. Somehow we are forgetting in government today that social justice is the point, and that in a local, state, or national community, social justice is ultimately up to all of us. The bigger point I'm trying to make is not about government, but about moral leadership. In our gathering this evening, I know our future governors and other political leaders. There are future leaders here in business, in industry, in the academy, in the arts, and community. You were admitted to Williams and cultivated while here as leaders. All I'm trying to say to you is to make room in your leadership for kindness, for justice, and maybe especially for love. You will be faced as leaders with lots of choices, many of them false. You will be advised to favor image over substance, self-interest over the common good, expedience over what lasts. You will have voices around you who will make moral leadership sound undisciplined, sanctimonious, and self-indulgent. But you should know that the people you lead are hungry for it and seeking a way to give voice to their own sense of justice and decency. I leave you with this story. Last summer, the Obama administration asked a number of states temporarily to shelter some of the refugee children stranded on our southern border. Unaccompanied children, some as young as three and four years old, were flooding across the border, having fled over thousands of miles from violence in Central America, and the federal authorities were overwhelmed. Feelings around immigration run hot, I get that. But to me, accepting the challenge to temporarily shelter these poor children was an act of both patriotism and faith. We are an extraordinary nation. Unlike any other superpower, America's power, to paraphrase a great man, comes from giving, not from taking. America, and Massachusetts in particular, have given sanctuary to desperate children for centuries. We have rescued Irish children from famine, Russian and Ukrainian children from religious persecution, 
Cambodian children from genocide, Haitian children from earthquakes, Sudanese children from civil war, and New Orleans children from Hurricane Katrina. Once in 1939, we turned our backs on Jewish children fleeing the Nazis, and it remains a blight on our national reputation. The point is that this good nation is great when we open our doors and our hearts to needy children, and diminished when we don't. There were those old ethical expectations at work in my decision, too. Jews and Christians are taught that if a stranger dwells with you in your land, you shall not mistreat him, but rather love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. In my faith tradition, we are admonished to take in the stranger for inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, Christ tells us, you did it to me. Every major faith tradition on earth charges its followers to treat others as we ourselves wish to be treated. Still, I knew our offer of shelter would be controversial. Indeed, for that on talk radio, I was called everything but a child of God. A couple of weeks later, on an unusual weekend morning without official appointments, my wife Diane gave me a list of stuff she wanted from the local Home Depot. It was early in the day and I thought I would just run out quickly on my own without bothering the state troopers in my security detail. By the way, they didn't like it when I did that. But I knew exactly where I was going and where to find everything on my list. So I set off in the truck dressed in my t-shirt, jeans, and flip-flops, a baseball cap, and dark glasses. It didn't matter. I was outed by the manager in the very first aisle. Governor Patrick, he said, welcome to Home Depot. <laughs> How can I help you? I encountered a man in the checkout line who was angry. Not rude or threatening, just angry and loud. He said, Governor, I couldn't disagree with you more about your offer to shelter these children. He said, my own wife is an immigrant. She came here legally, and that's the way it ought to be. I want you to know that I think you are wrong. I thanked him for his feedback. But you need to know it was clear to everyone in the checkout line and most of the people in the store who was mad at whom and what he was mad about. I had six other encounters on the same subject in that store that morning. In each of the others, same, someone came up and whispered, Governor, I'm with you. Or Governor, you're doing the right thing. Or Governor, thank you for doing right by those children. The calls to the office ran three to one in favor of sheltering those kids. It struck me how we've come to whisper kindness and to shout anger. I don't know if, it, if that comes from the hate radio shock jock culture we live in, and I don't care. It's time we learn to shout justice, to shout compassion, and to shout love. I don't see... I don't see how we can keep faith if we confine moral leadership to our Sabbath lessons and not admit it to our everyday lives or our policy. I guess I just don't know what good there is in faith if we can't and won't turn to it in moments of human need. Every one of you will face moral choices as leaders, as colleagues, as spouses and parents, as citizens and individuals, you will be faced with choices whether to show kindness, compassion, justice, even love. Because we are awash in them every day, you will know all the arguments for choosing otherwise, that you must not seem soft or weak or compromising or irresponsible. But if you look for the human being behind your choice, and reflect upon the ethical expectations you learned from your grandparents, your professors and mentors here, your own clergy and church ladies. I'm convinced you will choose wisely, and God knows we all need you to do so. Not just the mighty, but maybe especially the meek. It's a blessing to be with you.
Thank you. Good luck and God bless you.